Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honor and, and pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, data for policy and research. And uh, the last slide from T's presentation was great because it had this uh, interaction between It had this, uh, this, um, this, this chart was the interactions with data, policy, and, and research, and that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. Another thing that T mentioned uh, I thought was important, I'm going to talk a lot about data. I'm not going to talk a lot about theory, but clearly theory is important here. Uh, a lot of the, the way we think about data is, is driven by theory, and so even though I won't mention it very much, uh, that, that's going to be a key thing. Uh, before I go on, let me remind you that the views I'm going to express uh, today are my own and they may not represent the views of the New York Fed or the Federal Reserve System. All right. So before I, I give you a few examples of uh, interaction between policy and research uh, based on, on some of the experience uh, I had and, and my colleagues, colleagues have had at the New York Fed, I want to spend a few minutes just talking about uh, how to take advantage of the complementarities. So I'm going to provide a very, very simple framework to think of the complementarities between research and policy, why these two things are important to go together, and how best we can organize them. There's some sense in which uh, these complementarities uh, would suggest that it's natural for researchers to work with policymakers, but there are also reasons because of the production function of those two activities where this, this collaboration can be hard. And so I'll talk a little bit about that before getting into, into the examples. Um, I'll, I'll spend one slide just to, to describe how new, uh, the research is organized at the New York Fed just to give you a sense of, of where I'm coming from. And then I'll provide some example of, of su successful collaboration between policy and research. I chose my examples to sort of represent different kinds of interactions, some interaction between research and operational areas, some interaction between research and policy areas, some uh, instances where we found surprising results, results that we weren't expecting, and then different, uh, different ways in which we've been able to use our work to communicate. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> All right, sorry. <laughs> so, the reason good policy needs good data is that central bankers confront uh, important policy questions. And to make better decisions, they need better information. And that often comes from uh, anal analysis of data. And, and this, I think, has long been recognized in the fact that central bankers traditionally have had access to uh, data that only they can see that is important in, in conducting uh, that mission. But of course, what what central banks have to worry about is how they can make the best use of that data. And uh, policy and operational areas uh, are going to, uh, can work in, in a complementary way with, uh, with research in the production of good information from good data. So as we well rec recognize, it's not enough to have a lot of data. You have to be able to extract useful information from that data in order for policymakers to make good decisions. And that's where uh, research and, and, and policy can interact. Taking advantage of these complementaries can be tricky, and I'll, I'll say a word uh, about that. And so I'll describe a little bit uh, some thoughts I've had about the best way to structure interactions between research and policy that, that can help take advantage of that. So this is a very simple way to think about the uh, complementarities between policy and research. So in a central bank, policy areas have important and interesting questions that they need to find answers to. They have deep institutional knowledge. So one thing that might not be obvious for people who are not at central bank is that in order to make sense of the data that you have, you also have to understand sort of the institutional environment in which this data uh, is collected. And then they have data, some of which is confidential, so only central banks can actually uh, consider that. Now, what policy areas typically need is good analytical skills to make the most of their data and creative thinking. Now, this is not a criticism of central banks. It's just a recognition of the fact that there are very few people who are good at everything. And in central banks, if you're going to select people to bring them to policy areas, it's just not obvious that they're all so great at their uh, at, at analytical skills. And so there's a natural selection that makes uh, people who, are, who, who end up in, in policy areas not necessarily have have the greatest skills because those might not, the greatest analytical skills, because those might not be essential to, uh, to their task. And you can make a similar argument for creative thinking. It's
the case that central banks as public policy institution traditionally have to be conservative and that's probably important for them to be conservative and that conservatism doesn't necessarily lead to selecting the most creative uh, people. Now what research does have is typically the most up-to-date analytical scale. And, and maybe I should mention that when I think about researchers in Central Bank here, I'm thinking about people who are, either have a PhD in economics or finance or at least a master's degree. So some people who have a higher degree in, in these kinds of fields. And so by the nature of their work, the, 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 the fact that they, uh, they are doing research and they are looking to uh, uh, publish that research into peer-reviewed journal, they have to not only have but maintain extremely high-level analytical skill. And they're also trained to, th to think creatively. Part of the work of research is to come up with good ideas, better ways to think about problems. But what researchers often need is interesting questions to apply their skills. Uh, a lot, I think a lot of graduate students uh, and, and a lot of researchers throughout their careers sort of struggle with finding a good, really interesting question that they, that they can try to, to analyze. And then uh, understanding the institutional context and of course having good data. Understanding the institutional context is very important. And in a number of situations that I can recall recently, I, I have been conversation with academics, I'm describing a policy problem and say, well, of course you should do this. And the answer is, well, of course we should do this, but there's a law that prevents us from doing that. Or there's some kind of rules that makes that particular solution impossible to achieve. And so one of the things that you have to think about is, well, if I understand the institutional, institutional context and if I understand what the ultimate goal is, I can sometimes work around the constraints in order to get the right outcome. But it's very important in, in advising or providing policy advice to understand the context in which these decisions are made. Okay, so, so these are the complementar complementarities that we want to take advantage of and central banks around the world have tried a number of different models. And I'm going to provide two extreme models which I think resemble fairly closely uh, some central banks that I've had the chance of visiting. Uh, I'm not going to name names, uh, but I'm going to suggest that these two extreme models are less than ideal. So, so one, uh, one model is just to fully integrate economists into policy units or, or operational units. And one of the benefits of that approach is that economists are in direct contact with policy questions and they have direct access to data and they become very aware of the, of the institutional constraints that, that the area face. The, the cons in this is that the, the, those areas typically have very tight deadline and this reduces the incentives to preserve research time. So again, this is gonna come back to this idea of production function which is very different for research and for policy. Now, in the central bank, you would hope that at some level, the policymakers understand that research is an investment and that's something that they need to dedicate time to. But at the local unit, if you're the boss of a mix of people, some of whom are researchers and some of whom are not researchers, that researchers could really help you get that memo out by tonight if he was not doing his research. And that's going to put really difficult constraints and pressures on researchers when they are completely integrated into policy units. Now other central banks have tried to experiment with the full separation where economists work on, form their own units and, and are really sort of kept away from, from the policy process. And of course that preserves research time, uh, but the problem in those situations is that economists tend to lack familiarity with policy questions and important institutional details. So they, they are like these academics I was describing earlier, when you ask them a question they sort of come up with with a theoretical answer that doesn't take into account some of, the, some of the important dimensions of the problem that they need to think about. And so there seems to be limitation to these, to these two uh, uh, extreme uh, approaches. So let me, uh, let me provide on this slide just some of those things that I think we, sh we need to think about in, in order to take uh, advantage uh, of the complementary as best as possible. So first we have to recognize that research is different. And as I mentioned earlier, one of these aspects of the difference is the production function is quite, uh, is, is, uh, is different and difficult to understand. So skills are, are not the same between researchers and, and other central bank staff. Uh, I think that that's easy to, to observe and it can create some, uh, some, some lack of understanding between two, two areas. 
But, but uh, this idea that the production function is different, I think, is, is particularly important. So if I think of the New York Fed, uh, my, super, my colleagues in supervision are always thinking of a one-year plan, right? So they're, they're trying to plan, okay, what is supervision going to do this next year? Um, but in research, I've had several colleagues recently who, who, had their, who, who learned that uh, they had papers who were published in top journals, and these, these papers were, were started five years earlier. So, the, so the, the, the time it takes from taking a research idea and, and getting it accepted at top journal is just entirely different from the time it takes to, to sort of implement a, a, a policy program in a policy unit. And so people who are not used to those lags just don't understand what it takes. And that, that's, um, that it's understandable that they don't understand it. Uh, and so, but that, that can create sort of communication. You're sort of wondering, well, that researcher hasn't produced anything. What is he doing? Uh, well, it might just take time to get a paper in the, in the, in the American Economic Review or in Econometrica. At the same time, it's very important that research should not be an island. You don't want researchers to be entirely isolated. Uh, it's not enough to have good analytical skills. You have to understand uh, the, the, what the data means, where did they come from in order to produce good information. Um, and so there is, so one of the aspects I think is very important is to have frequent interaction between policy operational areas and the researchers. So if you put these ideas together, I think what you, what you want to uh, get towards is, is something that, um, that has uh, research be uh, separated in order to preserve uh, incentives and, and, and time for research. So it should be its own unit. It's very important that, that research in and of itself be rewarded, publications or, or other uh, products of that sort. And I also think it's very important for economists to report to somebody who has research experience, including publishing uh, in peer-reviewed journal, because if you have never done it, it's very hard to understand what it represents and the amount of work that, that, it, that it is. And so it's very hard to provide mentoring to the folks who work with you and also to to provide the right time allocation. At the same time, it's essential that economists are not just sort of consultant that you sort of bring in and ask them to, 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 to answer questions. They have to have a deep institutional knowledge, familiarity with the policy issues. They have to be deeply embedded in t with, uh, uh, or, or have frequent interaction, I shouldn't say embedded, the, the, um, with, with the policy and operational areas. In particular, it seems very important to include them in, in in cross-bank work so that, uh, so that other people feel that they're part, that they're part of the team. Um, so there's, there's clearly a number of ways you can, you can organize these things, but this is, this is an effort to be in the middle ground between the two extreme uh, e examples I gave earlier. All right, so, so this was the sort of the little framework I'm gonna propose. Let me describe research at the New York Fed and then I'm, I'm gonna provide you a few example. So the New York Fed has a pretty big group of PhD economists, there's 60 of us, and there's 45 research assistants. One of the reasons we're a big group is we cover a number of different areas. We have people working on macro, microeconomics, international, regional, capital markets, financial intermediation, and, and money and payments. I'm not going to talk a lot about RAs, but I think they're incredibly important in the production process of good research at the New York Fed. So we have 45, 45 RAs approximately. They're college graduates, so they finish their undergrad. They're hired for two years, and many of them uh, go on to, to get a PhD later. But I think the, this idea that they come in for two years and then they leave is incredibly important. They're not career, they're not there to you know, stay, and they're here to learn a lot and then leave and do better things. And, and I think that, that's a very good model. We aim to have 50% of time for research on average. One of the things that I'm not going to talk a lot about, but I think is really important, researchers have more flexibility with their time. So when, when there's a policy question that needs a quick answer, people in policy or operational areas have a full-time job, and then they are asked to dedicate additional time to think about this question that just came up. That's hard to do. Researchers, because they have, they, they have the ability to move uh, to, they have some, some ability to, to, uh, 
to change their time allocation can provide a lot of help in this sort of emergency time as long as they can be promised to have more, more time later to dedicate to this research. So I think this buffer role can be quite important. All researchers are expected to publish regularly. That's the only way that people maintain their human capital. Uh, involvement in policy work grows with seniority. I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the first year, uh, the, fir the, the first year PhD economists we hire essentially do no research. Eventually, uh, they do more of it. And of course, there's some selection into policy work. Um, and economists are expected to, to be research active uh, at all levels of seniority. Of course, the more senior people do less research, but they don't stop. And, and I think that that's important. Okay. So having said all that, let me describe a few examples uh, of some collaboration that I think have been very successful between uh, research and other areas of the New York Fed. So I'll, I'll start with payment research. Uh, Jamie McAndrews, who was research director until last year, uh, arrived at the New York Fed essentially to help uh, the wholesale product office, which is uh, the, the, the payment system that the New York Fed operates, redo their pricing. Uh, so that was one, one example of successful interaction between a researcher and an operational unit. And so, that, and, and, uh, so I, th I thought that was an interesting um, area to, to highlight. Uh, then I, I want to talk about interactions we've had with, with two other areas. One is uh, markets, and monetary policy implementation, and the other is supervision. And so I'll discuss um, the way we've interacted with both of these groups with respect to understanding the way the repo market functions in the U.S and the effects of, of new banking regulation. So there's a long tradition of collaboration between research uh, and, and the wholesale product office. So again, uh, Fedwire is the US large value payment system and that's operated at the New York Fed by the wholesale product office. And so we've over time uh, provided analysis to the WPO on a range of issues um, such as understanding the impact of pricing on volume and, and, and a lot of other things. And what we get in exchange for, for working with them, well, of course, we, we get to understand how, how their business work and we get to understand some important things about, about payments, but we also have data. And that data has been uh, tremendously useful for, uh, used in a lot of paper and, and, and uh, sort of generally been useful for us to better understand the way the, way the payment system works. So uh, recently, my colleagues Adam Copeland and Rob Garrett were asked to uh, study the effects of a new pricing scheme that the WPO had implemented. Um, and, and so what the WPO was trying to do is to, explain, to, to have a pricing scheme where after some amount of payment, so the way pricing works is that the sender of a payment has to pay a fee for each payment that is sent. And so after a certain number of payments, that fee would drop down. So the marginal cost of making your, making your payment would become very low. And they were hoping that by, by moving from a, a uniform uh, scheme to a scheme that, was, that, that, had the, that had a lower marginal cost, they were, they were going to be able to drive business uh, and, and have more volume. This is an important consideration, not because they're trying to make money, but the WPO functions on cost recovery. And so having more volume allows them to have lower costs on average. So, um, so my colleagues did that work and they were really surprised to find that in contrast to what you would expect from economic theory, the average user, which is fairly small it turns out, even though this is a large value payment system, behaves as if they care about the average cost rather than the marginal cost. And so this was a, this was a surprise. And so what, what we think is happening is that some users care less about the things that make Fedwire unique, which is the immediacy uh, and uh, the finality. And that's the only settlement platform in the US that provides that. And so for these smaller use users, they can do certain, a certain number of their payments on other platforms. And so they worry about the average cost of their payment rather than the marginal cost because they have that ability to substitute. For bigger users, which don't have the ability to substitute because, uh, because the immediacy and the finality is essential, it, it appears as if marginal costs are important, but it was just not enough data. There's, you know, there's a handful between five and 10 very heavy users, and there was not enough differentiation to, to extract information. So, so here's one area where um, being able to look at the data allowed us to first 
get something that's surprising from a perspective of economic theory, but was very important for the business in terms of understanding the way they were pricing and the, the impact that had. So, uh, one of the things that was interesting is that having access to this payment data allowed us to discover things um, related to, to the way uh, the payment system operates that were a consequence of monetary policy decisions. So, after the crisis, the large-scale asset purchase program that the Federal Reserve executed led to a very in large increase in supply of reserve from uh, approximately 20 billion before the crisis to more than uh, 2 trillion, approximately 2.5 trillion today. And so the increase in level of reserve has had a profound effect on, on, on Fedwire, which is something that we could have expected from theory, but we would have never been able to uh, get a, a, a handle on without knowing the data. And, and we would have, I think, never been able to guess that the effect would be so, so important. So this, this is a, a chart that shows you um, the, the change in the amount of reserves. Uh, so back until uh, the fall of 2008, there's a very, very small amount of reserve in the system. And as a consequence of lending facilities during the crisis, and then uh, three uh, sequences of large-scale asset purchases or quantitative easing, you see this, this very large increase. So two things. One is that it completely changed the time at which bank make their payments. So we, there's a theory that's fairly well understand, understood that suggests that when reserves are scarce, banks who don't want to borrow too much from the central bank in order to make their payments have an incentive to delay their payments, hoping that they will receive payments from other banks before they make their own payments, right? And so that's fairly well understood. And so we would have expected that when you increase the amount of reserves, then all the banks would be less worried about, about uh, delaying their payment and would be willing to, to, um, to make their, their payments earlier in the day. But we would have never expected that this, this effect should be, should be so dramatic. So on the x-axis, you have time between 1998 and 2015. This is taken from a recent paper from Jamie McAndrews and one of our RAs, Alex Kroger. And so each of these lines represents a percentile. So the first line says that this is the time by which 10% of the payments are being made. And the second line is 20%. So if you, if you look around uh, 1300, so one, one o'clock in the afternoon, so uh, between you know, 1999 and 2009, approximately 20% of payments were being done by one o'clock in the afternoon. After the large scale asset purchase, 50% of the payments are being done by that time. So why should we care? Well, what happens is that this reduces operational risk by a tremendous amount. We always had payments that were concentrated in the afternoon. But if you have an operation outage, the more payments that need to be processed, the bigger the problem you have with your system. If banks are making their payments early in the morning, you have, let, you have to worry less about operational outage, and you create uh, a system that, that's safer. And, and one of the things that comes out of this, this result, which is also very surprising, is even you might expect that if you increase reserves a little bit, you will have that effect and that those gains will dissipate very quickly. And it turns out that surprisingly, those gains seem to be maintained even with a very large amount of reserve. There's, there appears to be a marginal gain despite that. Another thing that's been in, interesting um, is to look at the amount of intraday credit that the Fed extends to to, up, to have a smooth functioning of our payment system. So before the crisis, because reserves were scarce, we made intraday credit available to banks so that they could make their payments as efficiently as possible. That means that the Federal Reserve would, would uh, extend, on average, between 50 billion and 100 billion intraday to, to the banking system. So that's not negligible amount and it puts uh, the, the Federal Reserve at some, ri some risk uh, in case the bank were not able to, to repay that credit. And so one of the things that we observed is that after we see that large amount of, uh, of increase in reserve, that, that amount of credit completely disappears. So we've lowered uh, the amount of credit risk that the Federal Reserve take because uh, it, through, the, through the payment system. So again, this is something that we could have anticipated in theory, but we would have we would have not been able to know exactly how much uh, it is without, without having the data. And this has important consequences for the risk profile of the institution. Okay, so let me now turn to the repo market. Uh, and so 
the, the US has a, a market, so repo stands for repurchase agreement, and repurchase agreement is like a collateralized loan where one institution will uh, lend to, to another, one financial institution would lend to another in exchange for some form of, uh, some security, like a, a government bond, for example, or uh, an asset-backed security. And one of, the, one of the features of repurchase agreements is that they're typically over-collateralized, that is, in order to protect the lender of cash, the, the, the borrower gives more securities in value than the cash they receive. And the amount of that over-collateralization uh, is called the margin or a haircut. So this market is, is a key market uh, for the funding of large investment banks in the US. So institutions like Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley fund their activities in, in that market. And there's two ways this market operates. One is uh, by having bilateral transactions where the two parties settle the transaction on their own. The other is that they use a third party to help them with uh, collateral management and, and settlement. This, repo, this market was, was uh, at the center of the financial crisis. Loss of repo contributed to difficulties of Bear Stern and Lehman Brothers, who were big borrowers in that market. And this is a market that we knew was very big, that we knew was very important. We just had no data until 2008. It was incredibly opaque. And so with the failure of Bear Stearns, we realized that it was essential to get data as quickly as possible to understand what was happening better. So we start obtaining, obtaining that data in the summer of 2008. It's now something that we get uh, on, a, on a regular day, basis every day and in much more granularity. But starting in 2008, we start to be able to see something about that market. The bilateral repo market remains quite opaque, unfortunately. So very early in the crisis, the academic world and, and to some extent policymakers become aware of an influential paper by uh, uh, Gary Gordon and, and Andrew Metrick at Yale who argued that the repo market was subject to a run in the form of a margin spiral. So what does that mean? Remember I said that most repos are over collateralized. So what that means is that if I am borrowing through a repo, I might give uh, 100 uh, dollars of treasury securities and receive $95 of cash. And that's a 5% uh, haircut. And so if that haircut increases, then that means that for the same amount of collateral I provide, I'll get less cash. And that's a problem because it's a little bit like a run. I'm getting less and less money for the same amount of, of collateral that I'm trying to find in. And so Gordon and Metric, they obtain some data um, from, uh, from a private source, and, and, and they, they observed that, um, that there was this huge increase in margin, and they think, they, they think that this is the key element uh, of the crisis. It turns out the market that they study is, in, is very, very different from, uh, from, the, uh, from the, the tri-party repo market, which is the key market where these institutions uh, get, um, get cash. So this is what, this is what uh, Gary and, and, and Andy published. And at the time, policymakers under seeing this and without understanding the way the, the repo market functions are convinced that the most important thing to do is address, repo is address haircut spiral. And a lot of the policy discussion is how can we set minimum haircuts so that they don't increase too much in the crisis. It turns out this market is an interdealer market it's not the source of fund for these institutions, it's just the way these institutions redistribute their funds among themselves. In the, in the market where these institutions borrow from non-dealers, from outside, the haircuts don't move at all. And so all of the work that was being done to try to understand how to stop repo uh, haircut spirals is essentially no longer relevant. And then people start moving to thinking about other ways in which this market might be fragile and other ways you can address that kind of fragility. So one of the things we were able to get is the tri-party repo book of Lehman Brothers. This looks a lot like people stop funding. It's not, it's not that they're increasing their haircut. In, in fact, we can show, so this is the repo book divided by different kinds of collateral. And you can see that on the Wednesday before Lehman Brothers declare bankruptcy, people just stop lending to it. 
and, and the amount of uh, funding they can obtain is, is dropping off a cliff. And um, I, I, it's not shown there, uh, but you can see that the repo, that the, the haircuts that Lehman Brothers is getting for its repo is not changing at all. So it's not that people are saying, I want more collateral. They're just saying, I don't want to lend to you. So the nature of the kind of fragility is entirely different. And it's very important to understand what, what is the nature of the fragility if we want to be able to think about how to make those markets uh, more robust. So this is another example that I like. The, the specific topic here is, is some of my colleagues who are looking at understanding the, the weighted average maturity of the repo book of these dealers against risky collateral. Uh, and you can see that through the efforts of our supervisors, the, the, these investment banks are having uh, are booking longer term repo, which is a good thing. They're taking less maturity risk. But the reason I bring this up is because um, this was published in, in a blog post of the Liberty Street Economic Blog. So the New York Fed a few years ago decided that they would have a blog. And when we had that, I, when, when, when Jamie created Jamie McAndrews, our former research director, created that blog. I think the idea was mainly that economists would have a way to advertise their research to a broad community. And we never understood, we never expected that uh, it would be used for the, for, for the purpose of this particular blog. So what happened here is that we have some colleagues in supervision whose job was to go to, the, to different firms and to say, well, we would like you to be responsible in the way you set the, 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 the weighted average maturity, the, the, uh, of your repo book. We would like you to, to extend the terms of your repo so you take less risk. But if you go to a firm, you can't tell them you're doing worse than, than your colleagues, because if you did that, you would be giving them, you know, private information. So what they said is, they told us, well, we'd like we work with you and we'd like to publish the distribution of what older firms are doing, and then we can go to each firm and say, look where you are compared to your peers. So this is now public information. The distribution is public information. So whereas our supervisors could not go and say, we know that you're doing worse to your, than your peers because we know what your peers are doing, which would be private information, they can just point to something that's public and say, here's, here's where you are. So this was a very f clever way for our colleagues to use the fact that we have a way of communicating to the public, put together some information that's sufficiently aggregate that there's no problem making it public, but then being able to use it to do their work. And so this was initiated by, by your colleagues from supervision, but I thought it was a great illustration of the way uh, research and, and supervision can work together. And since that, we've had other examples where we try to pursue, to, to support the public policy mission of, of, uh, of our colleagues in other areas. So the last example I want to talk about um, is, is related to, uh, to Basel III uh, regulation. And again, this is some work we're doing both with supervision, which cares about the regulation of banks, and with uh, our, our, our money, monetary policy implementation group, the markets group, who cares about the, the well functioning of the, the markets in which they, uh, they evolve, uh, including the, the repo market. So, Implementation of Basel III reg, uh, regulation differs ac across countries. So the, the principle of Basel III, as most of you understand very well, is to have as uniform as possible a set of rules across country so that, so that banks are properly regulated. But there is some discretion at the local level about how exactly to, uh, to do that. And so in, in some areas like Europe, regulated entities have to report their leverage ratio as a snapshot at quarter end. So the leverage ratio is a measure that simply determines how much leverage, how much equity you have compared to the total size of, of your balance sheet. And it doesn't take into account the risk that is on your balance sheet. It just wants you to have a minimum amount of equity no matter how, for, for a given size of balance sheet, independent of that risk. In the US, in the UK, and in some other countries, Banks have to report a daily, uh, an, an average, a daily average over a quarter. Okay, so instead of reporting a snapshot at what time, they have to average over all the days of the quarters. And so, these differences in implementation can matter tremendously. So why? 
So the leverage ratio is like a tax on intermediation activity, right? That's what it's supposed to do. But it's propor proportional to the size of the balance sheet and not the riskiness. So if you're doing an activity like a repo, which is incredibly safe, because you're protected by, especially repo against treasury securities, government securities, then um, this will have almost no additional risk on your balance sheet, but that activity will grow your balance sheet, and so it will be impacted by the leverage ratio. So we would expect a decrease in the market shares of dealers who are subject to the more stringent version of the regulation, like the US or the UK, because uh, the tax is not risk weighted. And so what we're able to see is that if you look at the share of assets done by foreign banks and domestic banks for, against the safest assets, so the, the ones that are, that are going to be most impacted by the leverage ratio, what you see is that the less regulated bank in red have increased their market shares compared to the more regulated banks. But if you look at risk assets, then you see almost no change. And so this is another example. And so what that means is that because these activities are done against higher collateral, there's more risk, then they are, they are less impacted by a not risk-weighted constraint and more impacted by a risk-weighted constraint. And so uh, the more regulated institutions are defending their market shares better in this area than, than in the other one. So here's a, this is something that has, that has implication for monetary policy and understanding how, uh, how, the, market, uh, how the repo market would, would perform if we had to operate in it uh, in large size. And, and knowing that domestic institutions are constrained in their ability to absorb repos could have consequences for monetary policy implementation. It's also important for our supervisors to understand how domestic, so foreign firms who operate in the United States but are regulated by a foreign regulator could behave differently than domestic firms because of those differences. Okay, so to conclude, um, Again, the theme of this conference is that good, good policy decisions are based on, on good information, and good information comes from good data. And what I've tried to, uh, to describe is that research and policy areas really a sort of natural complement in the production of good information. Um, but taking advantage of those complementarities can be tricky, and so you really need to think and work on having the best institutional setting for that, for that to happen. Policy areas naturally provide interesting questions, they naturally have deep institutional knowledge, and they have, uh, they have data. So one of the things that I thought was fascinating about uh, the, the, the conference in, in talking about the, the Townsend Thai data is that this data was created and there is, it's been used in, a, in an incredibly wide variety of ways that most people were not expecting at the time. Central banks have the opportunity to, to get data and they don't know yet how this data will be used, but it will give opportunities for researchers to explore new questions, to understand things that, that were not necessarily foreseen. So there's an incredible value in giving access to central bank data to researchers. And we function in an environment since the crisis where there's much more awareness in the academic community of the importance of institutional detail, the importance of how the way markets are organized influence outcomes, and being, and we have a, we have a vast variety of countries where these different institutional details perform different outcomes. So there's opportunities to sort of have quasi-natural experiment where you see the way different organizations produce different results. And researchers are particularly well-placed to sort of understand that and provide good advice on how we should design our financial markets. So a good structure for interaction between policy areas and research can help us get the most of, the, of those complementarities. And I think everybody benefits from that. Thank you.